There are two types of investors in the market. Those that understand history, that learn from their past, that understand that there are cycles and there are good times to buy and good times to sell. And then those that sit in the market that they buy expecting short-term gains, that don't understand their history, and that freak out during times of recessions and depressions. Now, I've spent the last 10 years learning so much about cycles from people like Fred Harrison, Phil Anderson, Ray Dalio, Warren Buffett, and all of the other incredible investors throughout history that have written books, produced podcasts on this stuff alone. So in today's video, I'm gonna talk about the 18.6 year cycle and how you can use it to make significantly better decisions, understanding when to buy, when to sell, when to use leverage, and when to get into a strong cash flow position to protect yourself during times like those in 2020, where the market has been a lot more shaky and then there's been a lot more fear in the market than times that we can remember. I'm also gonna talk about my exact plan to trade the 18.6 year cycle the five rules that I follow for every property that I personally buy, and then my two strategies for the two different types of properties I own. This is gonna be a huge and an action-packed video for you today. Lots of cool data, lots of cool ideas. As always, please take them with a grain of salt. Now, my name's Ben Everingham. I'm the director at Pumped On Property, and in 2020, I just bought my 13th property in the last 10 years. I've made a lot of mistakes, I've also learned a lot from those mistakes and made some really good investment decisions. I've also helped over 500 people from all over Australia and around the world buy properties with great potential for cash flow and great potential for long-term capital growth using my knowledge of Phil Anderson and Fred Harrison's cycle. Why this is important to you as an investor is imagine in 2019 that you knew that 2020 was gonna be a bumpy year with or without the stock market corrections, the recession that we're in at the moment, or the coronavirus. And imagine you used the knowledge of this type of bumpy market coming, which we call the mid-cycle slowdown, and I've done other videos on this in the past, to deleverage yourself, to put yourself in a strong cash position, to take yourself out of, for example, your super fund or your stock market, to get that 40% decline. Now the reason why it's so important to understand cycles is imagine in 2018, you knew like the clients and people that have been following this YouTube channel knew that a recession was coming in 2020 based on history and this time would be called the mid-cycle slowdown. You know, would you have been able to get yourself into a stronger cash flow position to understand it? had a couple of years to get yourself mentally prepared for the fear in the market right now, to get yourself out of the stock market before it declined by 30 or 40% and then to buy back in at that time, or to get yourself in a position where you've got strong cash or equity ready to go to buy the properties that are now on sale for five up to 20% discounts in all different parts of the world. This is why understanding this stuff is so important and hopefully after today you have a much better idea about where to take this forward into the future. Now, I originally came across this stuff from firstly reading Phil Anderson's work, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking, where Phil goes and looks at 250 years of booms and busts, recessions and depressions in the United States, and he found a pattern within that cycle. Now, Phil got inspired to go check out the US market after reading Fred Harrison's book, The Power in the Land, where Fred went and looked at 350 years of the same booms and busts and recessions and depressions in the UK. And both of them recognized, along with Ray Dalio, that there are cycles that markets move in. Now, sometimes markets are really, really well-priced and affordable, and other times they are very, very balloonish or bubbly, and at that point, they create asset bubbles. And obviously, at the top of these asset bubbles, there has to be a restabilization or decline. Now, you've seen this time and time again. You know, we're currently in the 2020 mid cycle slowdown, which will be the coronavirus triggering event. We've seen this in the GFC. We've seen this in the recession we had to have. We've seen this in the Great Depression. We've seen events like the black days in the stock market where they crash 
And we've also got a long enough understanding of history now to recognize that people that understand these things have a major advantage when they invest in assets. The 18 year real estate cycle according to Fred Harrison and Phil Anderson looks a little bit like this. We come out of a recession or a great depression or the GFC and we get about somewhere between six and seven years worth of upward growth. We then have a mid-cycle slowdown event where things decline for a little while, particularly stock markets normally get very hurt during this period. We then have a, another period of growth, the second half of the cycle, and then we have a, another major, much more severe decline, and then the cycle comes and begins again. Now, why it's so important to understand this as an investor, and I'm gonna go back to the previous cycle that we've gone through so that you can completely understand where we're at here. Imagine that at the bottom of the cycle after the GFC in 2010, you decided to start investing in some houses as well as some stocks. Um, you know, let's say that you went and bought a house in Sydney and then you started to buy the American Stock Exchange, so the S&P 500. Now, if you had have bought here, you would have been able to buy the stocks at about a 50% discount, and you would have been able to buy Sydney after it had literally just been flat for the nine years before it, and had also declined in value by about 10 or 15% during 2010 environment. Now, your plan was to do nothing but buy a place in Sydney and buy some stocks in the S&P 500 and then you held them until we got to here which was 2018. Now in 2018, you decided to sell your house in Sydney and in 2019, you decided to sell your American stocks because you knew what was coming next. Now, had you have bought these stocks in America, you would have made well over 100% over that seven year period and you would have made somewhere between 60 and 120% on that property in Sydney. Now imagine instead of going through this decline phase like everybody does, you cashed out of that property in Sydney and you were just holding it in cash. You got out of the stock market in 2019 and avoided that drop in the last couple of months at the start of 2020 of 40%. And then we get to this point, which is around about 2020 to 2021. And you reinvested that money, but because Sydney has done so well in the first half of this cycle, you decided now to go and buy a house in Brisbane or Perth, which historically does very, very well in the second half of the cycle. And you decided because the Australian stock market hasn't done well in the first half, you decided to buy the um, ASX 200, as well as a property in Brisbane. Now, the plan here could be to buy these properties and hold them to the top of the market somewhere between 2025 and 2026, according to Phil Anderson and Fred Harrison. And again, instead of going through a major decline, which is gonna be much more severe than what we're seeing at the moment, you decided to exit them wait for the bottom one, two, three years later, and then get yourself back into the market. Now, this idea of trading a cycle is new to so many of you, but it is the way that smart investors have always done it. It's the way that Ray Dalio's worst year in 42 years as an investor has been a minus 1.4% event. It's the reason why instead of just getting the average in the index funds of 7% a year, and the average in properties of 7% a year historically, people are able to get up to 10% returns on property and over 10% returns in the stock markets. It's not that they're doing anything different than you and I, it's just that they're understanding when to buy and leverage up and when to sell and get out of the marketplace before the storm comes through and wipes everybody out and takes away five years worth of gains from them. Now, I'm just gonna wipe this board and then come back to what I'm personally doing. I'll just be a moment. So let's take a look at the current cycle that we're in now. Now, if this cycle, according to Phil Anderson and Fred Harrison, started around about 2012, we've seen seven strong years here until we get to the mid-cycle slowdown point, which takes us through to 2019 
We then get a bumpy mid-cycle slowdown environment like we're in at the moment, which is 2020 to 2021. And then we move on to the second half of the cycle, which goes for between 2021 and according to Phil Anderson and Fred Harrison, somewhere between 2025 and 2026. Then we get what they call the major decline, um, which can last somewhere between 2026 and maybe 2029. And then we move into the next cycle from there forward. Now, in terms of how I've traded this particular cycle, what I did is I bought a number of houses between 2011 and 2020. Um, the first houses that I was buying was in Sydney um, and the Central Coast in New South Wales back in 2011. I then sold those properties out in 2016 and 17. Um, and then recently I've started to rebuy Brisbane. Now what's most important is what to do from this point forward as a property investor. So in 2020, um, because the market is in a recessionary period, it's now time for me to go out there and buy properties. So I will buy two houses and build two tiny homes on them this year. Now I plan on holding these particular properties forever. The market that I'm personally investing in up here at the moment is Brisbane um, for a number of reasons, but mainly because Sydney and Melbourne historically have always done better in the first half of the cycle and Brisbane and Perth historically based on my understanding have done very well in the second half of the cycle. Now there have been cycles where Sydney and Melbourne have also done very well in the second half of the cycle, but with affordability constraints at the moment and incomes not rising, I think it's gonna be tricky for them to do major growth unless they have a major decline in the next year or two. Now from 2021 through to 2023, I'll continue to accumulate two different types of properties. One are houses with the tiny homes and others are just high quality houses with potential. Now I will hold these houses with the tiny homes on them forever because it's important to have financial freedom long term and a passive income for life. It's also very important to have a passive income during these major decline style environments. And then these houses that I buy will be places with either subdivision potential, duplex potential, renovation potential, or knockdown rebuild potential. I'll accumulate a couple of these over the next two or three years. I'll make whatever growth comes over this second half of the cycle. I'll clean the properties up or develop them just before the top and then sell them off for a profit and I'll take that cash. I'll sit it as cash for a little while and then I'll invest back in the stock markets when they're on sale at 50 cents in the dollar and back in Sydney and Melbourne when the values of properties in those areas look more like what I'm prepared to pay for them after a five or 10 year flat period once you take in the major decline that they're gonna go through up here out of the equation. So what I wanted to do now is sort of rub this off the board for you and then talk about my personal plan, the rules that I follow and the two different types of properties that I buy for myself so that you can understand exactly what I plan on doing from here forward. Now for me personally, there's five rules that I follow when buying any investment property. And this is based on my experience of buying a lot of property and listening to a lot of different people talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked for them. Now the first thing that I do is I absolutely make sure I nail timing. There's a lot of information out there to say that it's time in the market, which I completely agree. And some assets that you're gonna hold for the rest of your life you know, really doesn't matter when you buy them. But for people like me who are trying to get above average returns on their investments and their stocks, timing is absolutely key. So that means after a recession or a great depression or a GFC, I would be personally looking to time the market by stocks at a discount and properties at a discount. Um, when we get through the first half of the cycle and into the second, that's when I really wanna use timing to again, strategically pick stocks as well as strategically pick properties that represent good value at that time. Now the second thing I'm always looking to achieve with any property that I buy for myself is capital 
growth. Now, I do this from targeting quality property. Now, quality to me means buying houses because houses have outperformed units in Australia by 96% in the last 20 years. I do it through buying metro markets because they've performed 86% better than regional markets in the last 25 years according to CoreLogic. I do it through buying Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane because that's where 75% of Australia's population and job growth is going to occur. I do it through buying big blocks of land in suburbs that are extremely high in quality within 20 k's of the city or walking distance to the beach. And I follow the fundamentals of where would I like to raise my family over the next 20 years and my children. So good schools, universities, train stations. So capital growth is the second thing that I'm always looking to achieve. Now, the third thing that has become more and more important to me, particularly in environments like the one we're in now, is cash flow. I think this is completely undervalued in Australian property investing right now. And I think there's a lot of people that would be hurting right now because they've lost jobs and they own negatively geared properties that are costing them something to hold. So the way that I get cash flow is simply from buying a home and adding a second tiny home or granny flat, you know, a dual income style property. So I'm getting two incomes rather than just the one. Now, the fourth thing that I target with buying any property is something that I can add value to. Now, this could be simply buying at a good time and buying a place that needs a renovation in 15 years time. It could be buying a piece of land and rebuilding, or it could be something more complicated like a subdivision or a duplex or a townhouse site, but I always want something where I can get it below market value and then add some value to that property over time. Just in case the market doesn't do all of the heavy lifting, there's something that I can do there to control the outcome of my decision. The fifth thing that I'm always looking for is a tax benefit. Now, whether you're earning $50,000 a year or $50 million a year, you're probably paying more tax than you should. So I buy properties that help offset that tax and that is the beautiful thing about investing in Australia. Talk to your accountant, talk to your financial advisor about this stuff, figure it out because if you can reduce your tax position, you've got more money to go out there and invest. Now, again, I'm just gonna wipe this board clean and I'm gonna focus on the two types of strategies that I have and I'll show you exactly what I plan on doing over the next few years to set myself up for this second half of the cycle. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about in today's video is the two strategies that I have when buying investment properties. So they are completely different and so many people I talk to sit on either one side or the other side of this equation. Um, now, the first strategy that I have is really about financial freedom. Now, I believe that the sooner you and I can achieve a financial freedom and get a baseline level of passive income coming in, whether we get out of bed or go to sleep, the sooner we can make better quality choices in our life. Now, investing can be either short-term or long-term. And when I'm talking about this side of the equation, this is the longer-term Time frame. These are the properties that I buy and I hold for the rest of my life and I pass them on to my children so that they start life in a different position than I did. Now, the types of properties that I buy on this side are very simple. Houses with secondary tiny homes or granny flats attached to them. It is really that simple. For me personally, I'm looking for six figures of passive income through my property portfolio for the rest of my life. Now, I haven't achieved that yet, but that's what I'm working towards. So for me, um, I'm looking to buy four of these houses with four of these granny flats, and then I wanna aim to own them completely outright in the future. Now, this is my insurance policy. This is my achieving financial freedom. This is my extremely long-term, low-risk strategy. This is sort of just my bread and butter, never have to be on the pension, never have to worry about money again type of thing. Now for you, 
It might just be one house and one granny flat. It might be the two properties, the financial freedom strategy we talk about, or maybe it looks like 10. You go as far as you personally wanna go. Now, the second strategy that I personally have is very, very different. This is a short-term strategy, and this is a much more active, higher risk strategy. Now, the only reason I do this is because one, I know how to do it. Two, I take the active income that I earn here to create chunks of cash, and then I pay off these properties faster because I don't wanna wait 30 years to pay off these houses that produce great cash flow for life. I wanna pay them off in seven years, I wanna pay them off in 15 years to get financial freedom sooner so that I can have the choices in my life sooner. Now on this left-hand side column here, this is my time in the market, my long-term strategy. And on the right-hand side, this is my timed strategy. This is a short-term thing. So what I personally do here or what I focus on is, for example, buying Sydney in 2011, selling it in 2016 or 17. Buying Brisbane in 2020, selling it in 2025 or 26 or 27, whenever Brisbane tops out at that time. Now, I use the timing of markets and Phil Anderson and Fred Harrison's real estate cycle to do this. I also do other things. So I buy houses that I could reno or buy houses that I could develop and make a profit from. Now, like I said, the only reason in the world that I do this is to pay off the debt on these longer term properties faster than the average 30 year principal and interest home loan. So these are my two strategies. In terms of where I'm at at the moment, I'm still accumulating some properties here. And then from next year and the year forward, once the market stabilizes itself a bit, I'll start to buy more of these shorter term properties and then obviously sell them out in the future. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know there's been so much to it. I've talked about the 18.6 year real estate cycle. I've talked about why it's important. Um, to get more information on it, go check out Phil Anderson, Fred Harrison, and Ray Dalio's work on it. Um, I've talked about how I plan to trade the cycle, which is super simple. Second half of the cycle, which we're going into now, buy Brisbane, buy Perth, um, get into a strong cash position and sell out of any assets I don't wanna hold before we go into the next GFC. And then after we come through that GFC and we're back to the start again, I like to buy Sydney and Melbourne because historically they've done much, much better in the first half of the cycle. Talked about the five rules that I follow being timing, capital growth, cash flow, properties that you can add value to and properties that give you tax benefits. And I've talked about my two different strategies, one being a bread and butter, safe, recession-proof strategy, high quality properties that you hold long-term with great income, as well as a shorter term, more active, higher risk strategy, where I time the market and I buy assets that I can add value to, to pay off these properties faster. So regardless of where you're at, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope I haven't overcomplicated it too much. Please subscribe to this channel. Please give us a thumbs up. Please share this with someone that needs to understand this stuff. Please go read Phil Anderson's work, Fred Harrison's work, Ray Dalio's work. Go check out the other videos I've done on this. Don't freak out when we get to the environments like the one that we're in at the moment. It represents an incredible opportunity if you understand it and you've prepared for it. I've been talking about this in videos for two, almost three years now. All of my clients knew that 2020 was gonna be a bit of a bumpy year with the coronavirus, you know, was the unknown trigger. Um, we've been through this before, we'll move through it again. As always, stay safe and I truly wish you all the best. And the more of this stuff that you can learn, the better off you'll be as an investor to manage your risk and to take advantage of markets as they come. Cheers.